Our next speaker here is Dr. Christian Winkler, and he will be uh, showing us how we can use Varnish Web Cache to increase the performance of dynamic websites. Thank you very much. the title. Um, first, for me, I'm working as an enterprise architect specializing in high performance scalability stuff working for MGM Technology Partners, which is a software which is doing software development projects. We have several large projects, usually with lots of data, and scalability is always an issue for us customers. Uh, for example, Elster Online, the German tax system. Um, we work a lot for Lidl, which is also uh, what uh, this talk is based on. We work for Hewlett Packard and, for example, in Nuremberg also for GFK. So let's start by first taking a look. Um, well, basically, the whole presentation is based around the online shop. So if I talk about the website and the online shop, that's basically always the same. So you can, that's used interchangeably. But first, we'll take a look at uh, how we can make the, the online shop ready for many visitors at once. Because in order to sell something, of course, you have to make the visitors first happy. And then uh, you can start thinking about um, how to actually sell stuff to the visitors. Yeah? So w what is a typical problem scenario for online shops? Well, of course, you have a growing number of visitors. You have a growing number of accesses. Internet access is getting faster and faster. And the patience of the people is, on the other hand, uh, getting worse and worse. So the scenario basically looks like this. You have a lot of people accessing the poor web server at once with many different browsers, many devices, different form factors, but always getting faster internet access. So you have to make sure that you are also, you, that you have the capaci capacity in order to deliver pages really fast. That's one part of the problem. The other part of the problem is that this is uh, the typical load diagram of, of such a website. So basically, almost all the time, the servers are just idling away, so they don't have much work to do. But um, as soon as we have a special campaign, something is sold for a very special price, or we have uh, a newsletter which is sent to several million subscribers, then you have these uh, peaks or spikes in, in the load or in the, in the visitor graph. And of course, unfortunately, you have to build all servers that they are ready to serve pages when these spikes or when these peaks happen. It's basically the same if we are working for Lidl like they, they have in their usual supermarkets, because if you go to the supermarket on Saturday morning, it's usually crowded, but uh, it's much easier for them because they know in advance and they can just uh, hire enough cashers or whatever so that they, they don't have uh, queues and people don't have to wait so long if they want to buy something. That's more difficult in our scenario, of course. If we knew in advance when these spikes happen, then we could uh, use some sophisticated cloud technology or whatever in order to have enough servers ready so that uh, pages really get delivered uh, fast. But usually that's just not possible because you have so many uh, factors like you have a TV spot or whatever which you don't know in advance or which you cannot tell when they exactly happen, these spikes, um, so that you have to be ready all the time basically. So the solution is, um, of course, one solution would be just to buy more servers. But you always have to consider the peak performance, so you have to buy enough servers to well, be comfortable in that peak situation, but if you take a look at uh, the normal situation, it's complete, complete nonsense to buy so many servers, um, because in the normal situation, they would just be well, basically unemployed. They don't have to do anything. Yeah? And on the other hand, um, it's expensive buying and maintaining all these servers. And we are working for Lidl. Lidl is a discount company, so you can't tell them buy 50 servers. So they won't say, no, we won't do it. Yeah? You have to find a, a more clever way in order um, to deliver pages really speedily to our customers. Yeah? That's what we are doing all the time. So they are optimizing, of course, their business. And they want also to have an, an optimized online shop. So this is not efficient, so this is not uh, what we can do. So we have to find a different solution. Now, um, observing what happens if somebody or if a lot of people are accessing um, web pages, especially uh, home pages, you see that almost all people here, except for the guy with the glasses, um, they get the same home page. So everybody accesses the website, gets the same page, which is 
unfortunately individually produced just for that user, except for the fact that it's as though it's individually um, produced, it's the same as everybody else gets. Um, so that doesn't make too much sense. Only the guy with the glasses, maybe he has something in his uh, shopping basket or he's personalized or whatever, so he gets a different copy. So, of course, that's uh, not very efficient to handle that in exactly that way. And so we thought, well, what, what could be improved? So the idea is that um, this one single page, which is, for example, the home page, would be the same for all of these stateless users. I'll explain that in a minute, what it means. Um, and this user with the glasses, he's a stateful user because he has a state which is... Uh, persisted on the server like a, a shopping basket or some personalization or maybe he is in already in a transaction um, because he is just in the process of buying something. So he gets of course an individual copy which is really different from the page which the other users see. So in order to make that as efficient as possible, of course we need to employ some kind of caching. And uh, the most efficient caching, of course, the, 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 the online shop al already does some caching in the, in the back end, in Hibernate, in the database, and whatever, but that's just not enough. And the most efficient caching is, of course, caching the page itself. So, for example, the home page or any other product page or any other campaign page. So, caching the HTML, which was individually generated for one user, but which is the same for all users, caching that in the front end and just uh, search that identically cached copy to each customer which we do know nothing about. If we know something special about the customer then of course uh, we'll treat him or her specially by um, contacting the application server and generating an individually different page for him or for her. So the idea was to find a caching solution which really works in the front end and which caches HTML pages. So it's not so easy to find a suitable cache. We had some, well, missed choices which we made. Uh, I'll explain that in a minute, what happened there. Well, basically the requirements are, of course, it has to have a high performance and, a stip and it must also be very stable because um, that's the first contact for all customers to the online shop. So if it's not stable and if it's not running, then the shop will not be available. So if it's available, it's fast. but. Usually it's not available, so we would not have won anything. So it has to be really stable. And the, the, main, the, the main part which we really can influence is the hit rate. So we have to optimize the whole scenario for a high hit rate. Because if we have, for example, a hit rate of 90%, we are 10 times more effective than without a cache. But if we have a hit rate of 99%, we are 100 times more effective. So the goal is really to optimize the hit rate. And uh, strangely enough, but it's really true, the choice of the caching software really influences the hit rate for some really strange effects which you'll see on, on later slides. Huh? Um, the configuration has to be really flexible because um, some pages might be cached, some might not be cached. We have to differentiate which user is already personalized or is, during a, is in a transaction or is uh, having a, a shopping basket and we need a powerful cache management. Why do we need that? Um, for example, our first choice, um, the Apache mod cache, does not have a, a, a powerful cache management. Um, that works really quite stupidly. Um, Apache just caches everything which it gets from the backend server in the file system by creating something like four files for each request, which is a lot if you have thousands or several thousands of uh, pages that fills the file system. Um, you cannot easily expire it, and it's not expiring itself. So that means Apache mod cache, if you ever happen to encounter that, it's uh, a bit uh, strange, it behaves strange, because um, if you access something, then it's put in the cache and it's delivered from the cache. But this cache never gets expired. So only the next time the same page is requested, Apache takes a look inside its file system, sees whether the page is still current, and if it's not, it's uh, removed and a new copy is uh, requested. But if it's never requested again, it stays in the cache forever. And uh, of course it floods the cache. And 
rem or l let's say um, that they plan, and uh, this is what, what Lidl does, that they plan a new campaign, they do this every week, then they have to empty the complete cache, and emptying a complete cache worth several hundred thousand of files, uh, that's difficult, it, it takes long. Yeah? So that means Apache ba basically is not suitable for doing that. Uh, we did that for some time, but um, it was not working well, and it was also not experiencing a high hit rate. So searching a bit longer, uh, for caching solutions you encounter something like Squid. Squid is uh, usually used as a web proxy, but you can also use it as a reverse proxy. But um, it has a declarative configuration and that's a bit difficult to handle um, because you want uh, something which is imperative. You want to say the cache when it should cache and when it should not cache and which keys exactly it should consider in caching all that stuff. That's not possible with Squid. That, that's why we have not chosen Squid but uh, chosen Varnish. Varnish is also an open source software. It's specifically used for um, caching for an HTML front end cache. It has an atomic cache management. That means expiring the cache is an atomic operation. You say it has some kind of web API. You say expire everything and it says, okay, everything expired. It's really atomic. It's from one second to, to the next second. Of course, it does not delete everything, but uh, it knows that uh, now nothing is, is current, so uh, all objects are basically stale then. Uh. Um, it's extremely f flexible. It, ha it has a procedural configuration, and that's something which is really tricky um, because let's assume that you have a complicated configuration uh, and each request which comes inside the whole cascade goes via the Svanish. And if the configuration is complicated and it's interpreted, then of course a lot of performance can be lost in Varnish and you gain a lot of latency. So latency increases and that's of course not what we want. We want more performance and we want the latency to be as low as possible. And that's uh, what they did uh, really excellently, I think. Um, Varnish is super fast and it's not only because of its internal handling, but also because of some very nice ideas, I think, which I'll, I'll tell you on the, on the next few slides. So the architecture basically looks like that, that uh, you, we get uh, HTTP accesses, and that's uh, another point. One is only responsible for HTTP. It can't handle HTTPS. For our scenario, it's not necessary because we have a load balancer where SSL terminates. Um, you can, for example, use a HA proxy in front of that and handle uh, SSL via, via, this, uh, via this software. But Varnish is only responsible for HTTP. Varnish in our scenario then uh, distributes uh, load to different Apaches. In fact, two Apaches just for failover reasons. Uh, Apache is still necessary because Varnish is only a cache it does not deliver any static files. It's just a cache. It only caches stuff. So, um, of course, we could also have used Tomcat um, for serving the static files, but uh, Apache was already present, so that's why we used Apache to serve all these static files. And um, everything else is going um, from Apache via AJP to Tomcat, in this case, uh, which is uh, responsible for JSP. It has a uh, Hibernate and a database sitting behind us behind it, but that's not, not, not so important now. Okay, what, what are the necessary tasks for Varnish? Uh, Varnish is now responsible for the HTTP access for all users, and uh, therefore its, its HTTP port is exposed in the internet. So uh, you have to be clear about the fact that uh, you also get uh, some additional component which you have to do security reviews and so on, because um, all HTTP accesses go to Varnish. Uh, usually it's not so much of a problem because uh, Varnish is not used so frequently, so basically if there are attacks, uh, people usually will be attacking Apache, which is not exposed anymore to the internet, so in this respect you could even say that you improved your uh, security. But to be honest, there is just a new component sitting and listening on port 80, which you have to take care of, so you have to be careful. Yeah? It's usually sitting directly behind the load balancer, but that might be a configuration which depends on the way how you want to use it. Varnish is also responsible for distributing the HTTP accesses to the backend system. So it has 
to analyze the requests, understand what is inside the requests, find out the responsible system um, which is suitable for delivering that request. Let's say uh, you have maybe different backend systems. Um, you also can consolidate them in Varnish and make them available from just a single domain. And of course, and that's the main purpose why we have chosen Varnish, it's also responsible for caching the response. It must maintain and expire the cache. Um, we can configure a maximum size of the cache, and uh, we have some automatic and manual expiry, um, and an expiry, of course, so of course, also if the if the cache is full. So, what does it mean? Uh, manual expiry. I already talked about that. If uh, there is a new version of the website online, of course, we have to expire everything which is old. Um, we have an automatic expiry um, because. Uh, we have some objects, some entities sitting in the cache which are only valid for, let's say, something like five minutes or ten minutes. Yeah? If you have products inside uh, your cache, uh, products have availabilities, and the availabilities, they tend to change. Yeah? So some products might be available for some time, but afterwards they might not be available. That's why we have adjusted the, the time for the products, for example, or for the campaigns to be something like five minutes or ten minutes, because that's, of course, something which you can live with, because you have the same problem if somebody is accessing the page and is doing some nothing for five minutes, then the page is also five minutes old. So that's uh, some time frame which you can adjust, but I think it's not not really critical to have it uh, set to five minutes. And usually if you consider these spikes, which I've shown you in the beginning, um, all requests within five minutes which you can save and which are not going to the application server, it's really a lot. So that means even if we only cache the pages for five minutes, we save 10 or even 100,000 of requests which are not going to the application server but handled by the cache directly. <coughs> and it must write log files. Yeah? Uh, that's important because um, many requests will not even reach Apache. So um, if you have, for example, infrastructure in place to read the Apache log files for some statistics and so on, that's of course not possible anymore because you have to ask Varnish to write the log files. Yeah? Varnish has very sophisticated and unusual logging facilities um, because um, for the sake of performance, usually it does not log anything. It has a ring buffer and writes everything to its internal ring buffer, and you have external scripts which can read the ring buffer and uh, project exactly what you are looking for and write that to log files. But you, you have to be aware of that, that usually Varnish is not logging, because uh, even writing the log file um, for, well, for the dimensions which we are operating in is a serious bottleneck or can be a serious bottleneck um, because log files tend to be large. So uh, if you have many, many requests flowing in and Varnish is really very fast, then um, the request rate might even be, well, m m might even be limited by uh, the right performance to the log files. What is not part of Varnish tasks, I already mentioned it, is static content because that's the, the web service res responsibility and it does also not handle SSL. So let's take a look at what uh, Varnish is exactly doing. Yeah? So um, there are different phases in the request which are called um, VCL for Varnish Configuration Language Receive. That's when the request is initially received by Varnish. And let's first take a look at uh, what Vanish is doing if the request is not cacheable. So what happens is that uh, some user or some load balancer or whatever accesses uh, Vanish, asks for some entity, and uh, we get in this VCL receive function also within the Vanish configuration language, and there we, we can decide what's going, what's going to happen. So for some reason now we start with a non-cacheable entity, maybe because uh, we know that the user is already in a stateful phase, has acquired a session, or has some transaction going on, or whatever. So I'll talk later about how we can decide whether that's really the case. So we get inside this uh, VCL receive function, and then um, we can return a special value which is called pass, and pass means just pass it on to the backend server. The backend server in this case is Apache. We don't care what Apache does. Maybe it has to forward this even to Tomcat, or maybe it's some image, and then it can be returned immediately. And uh, returning that means returning, of course, because uh, now Varnish created the request. 
returning that to Varnish. Then it goes to a different phase inside Varnish, which is called VCL fetch, because now it has been fetched from the, um, from the backend server. And then it goes into an even different phase. That phase here in, in that case does not make too much sense because it's not cached, but you'll see it in a minute what's the difference. And then it gets in the VCL deliver phase, and during the deliver phase, it's really sent to the, cust uh, to, 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 the uh, to the user who requested that original page. Yeah? During all that phases, during the VCL receive phase, for example, you can access all headers which have been sent, which are usually quite uh, extensive, and during that uh, VCL fetch phase, you can access the response headers which have been sent by the backend system. And during that VCL deliver phase, you can modify the response headers which are actually sent to the user. So you have total freedom of what you can do with your request. Uh, and um, the Varnish configuration language, as I told you, is an imperative language. It's a procedural language. It's very similar to C. And in fact, it's really compiled to C when um, Varnish is started. And that C-like language is not only compiled to C, but it's compiled to a shared object and is then integrated into Varnish. Why are they doing this? Because every request has to go via this pipeline. So you really lose a lot of latency during that request phase. And if you have something which needs to be interpreted for each request, you gain, of course, you in increase your latency. But if you have something which is actually translated uh, to a binary, then it's the fastest possible way of handling that. And I think that's, uh, that's a very good idea doing this because um, usually your configuration gets more and more complicated because you want to decide how to handle cookies, how to remove cookies, which, uh, how to determine under which index some entities should be saved or not saved and so on. So the code tends to get more and more complicated. And if you, for example, compare that to either Apache or Squid, where you have a declarative configuration and during each of these uh, of these phases, it has to go uh, through, this imp uh, through this declarative configuration, then of course it's much more inefficient than um, going directly through binary code and deciding what's, what's going to happen with that. So what, what is different now if, uh, if a request is, is cacheable? Of course, we uh, again get to the VCL receive phase, but then um, we say not pass, not pass it to the backend system, but look up. That means look it up in the cache with a key. You can determine the key. Usually some headers are taken into account for determining the key, but this can be influenced. So you can you have complete freedom of what you want um, as an index, and that's important. We'll also see that later. And um, if it's inside the cache, uh, you'll see it uh, on the same slide in a moment, then it's immediately returned. But if it's not, then um, we get in this VCL miss phase, which means that it's again requested from Apache. Apache again returns it. We are in the VCL fetch like we were when it was a non-cacheable re uh, request. Um, then we return a special signal which is called hit for pass. That means please put it in the cache. Then it's put in the cache and it's delivered afterwards. It's much easier if it's already in the cache, because then we are again in this uh, VCL receive. It's looked up in the cache, and we get the VCL hit, and we still can modify headers in VCL deliver if we want to. So as an overview, that's the whole anatomy of the, of the request, and uh, that's basically how it works. Uh, so in each of these functions, you have uh, the complete freedom of modifying either the, uh, the request headers, the response headers uh, from the back end, or the response headers which are actually sent to the client. So w what, we tr what we tried to, to tell you here is that um, when starting, for example, with an online shop, the first solution is, of is often a very naive solution where you say we have many database accesses, so using a, a standard application server, you get maybe something like 100 requests per second, which is okay. 
An improved solution would be to use a database cache, which uh, means that you have far fewer database accesses and which uh, boosts your request rate to maybe 500 requests per second, which is still a lot, but uh, during these peaks, it's just not enough. But using Varnish, um, it's very easy with standard commodity hardware to get to 10,000 requests per second and be at the gigabit limit. So. It, it, it just can't handle more because uh, the limit of the interface is, uh, is uh, the interface easily can be saturated by the software. Even if you have complicated requests and even if you're doing a lot during request processing, that doesn't do any harm. So uh, you can easily saturate the gigabit interface with Varnish. It's, it's really trivial, yeah? so it's, it's not complicated. Yeah? And um, we could even reach more requests per second if we had a faster uh, Ethernet interface, but uh, well, using bonding, usually you can maybe uh, increase that to 2 gigabit, but as soon as you want something like 10 gigabit, it's getting really expensive because all other components in your network infrastructure like load balancer and so on also have to go up to 10 gigabit, and that's something which is still really, really expensive. So why, why is Varnish so fast? Uh, it has a very clever memory management because it says um, the memory management is delegated to the operating system. So they just have one large file, which is, let's say, one gigabyte, and the gigabyte file is M mapped. So if it's possible, then it's put to RAM. If not, then it's uh, delegated to the, to the operating system how to efficiently manage that. And all objects live inside that file in a very special data structure. Yeah? And so they have not four files per entity which is safe, but uh, just one file for all entities, which makes it, of course, much more efficient. Yeah? Um, usually all objects are delivered from RAM. Um, the same is true, and uh, I missed that, I'm sorry, uh, for this. Um, for this logging facility, which is also inside this ring buffer, just in order to save I.O. bandwidth to, uh, to slow disks or disk arrays. Um, it's just in, in a ring buffer, and it has maybe something like 10,000 entries in the ring buffer, and then it's again rotating. And if you want something from the log files, you have external scripts which can access this uh, um, ring buffer and write everything which you really need to disk, even in NCSA log file format, so that if you have existing tools for analyzing the log files, you don't have to, you don't, you don't have to change anything. Yeah? But uh, if you don't need it, you can discard it and gain additional performance. I already talked about the compiled configuration, um, so there are no bottlenecks for the requests because the configuration tends to get more and more complicated. It's absolutely essential to have a high hit rate because otherwise um, the benefit is just too low. Yeah? If we have introduced another software component, so we really need to work hard in order to increase the hit rate and make it as high as possible. So we have to think very carefully before implementing, and what is absolutely crucial is uh, monitoring the hit rate because very small changes in the website can have dramatic effects um, for the hit rate. And usually you don't see it until you have, again, one of these spikes. Uh, and if you have these spikes and uh, your hit rate is low, then your application servers will be tortured and the whole website will become slow. So it's really essential to monitor that all the time, even if the load is low on, 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 on the servers. How can we improve the hit rate? So usually what is really hurting the hit rate is uh, everything which is related to state. And most of the time in our days, uh, state is uh, related to cookies. Yeah? So we have to differentiate between different types of cookies. So there are cookies which are relevant for caching. Um, we can either use them as an index. Let's say you have a, a cookie which where there are only five different versions or five different values of the cookie. Then, of course, you can use the value of the cookie as an index in the cache, and for each page, you uh, you cache five different versions depending on the uh, on, on the value of the cookie. Language, for example, would be uh, such a uh, such a cookie value. Yeah, if you have the uh, site, let's say you're in Switzerland, you have the site in three languages, and you decide which language you have via cookie, then uh, it can either be DE 
IT or uh, FR the cookie value and you would use that as an index for the cache and cache every page in three different versions for the three languages yeah, in order to still be efficient. Um, the other possibility is um, if a if a cookie is really relevant, let's say it's a session cookie, and you detect that the session is really necessary, that means that the application server is only supposed to set session if sessions if it really desperately needs the session. So as soon as you detect the, um, the session inside the cookie, you just say caching stops at that moment. Yeah? So um, if some session becomes stateful or if some user becomes stateful because of uh, baskets or personalization or whatever, you set the cookie in the application server and then you say, no, um, co uh, caching actually has to stop. They are irrelevant cookies and they can either be ignored or they can also be deleted in, uh, in this VCL receive phase. Um, there are complicated uh, cases like uh, cookies which are partly relevant for caching and um, for these kind of cookies you can delete the irrelevant parts. You can do that because you have that C-like language which of course uh, gives you the possibility of modifying strings and so on and cookies are nothing more than strings so you can just go ahead and modify the values of the cookies in order to only keep the parts which you really need for caching and everything else is just discarded. There are other um, important uh, hints that, for example, you have to normalize the headers. You have to take a look at exactly which headers really have an impact on the content. For example, there might be content negotiation, there might be vary headers and so on. Um, if it's possible, you should avoid these headers and uh, make the content or create the URL structure of the site in such a way that the URL uniquely identifies the content which is delivered from this URL. Because then you have really the, the, the best chances of having a high hit rate. Um, you should reduce yourself to really strictly necessary headers and uh, use the critical headers if you really have some of these as an index for the cache. But that of course only makes sense if you have certain discrete values of the headers and it doesn't make sense if you have a completely continuous spectrum of the headers because then effectively your hit rate is uh, zero so it's not even worth caching these kind of requests. This is a very interesting thing uh, regarding um, compression, which is also handled via headers. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, gzip or deflate compression. Um, that's uh, something which all clients or all browsers uh, support. And um, they send uh, one of these accept encoding headers. And um, then they really um, are ready to either um, receive deflate or gzip encoded content. So the funny thing is that Internet Explorer, for some reason, um, sends the accept header, the accept encoding header, deflate gzip. That means basically, well, it, it doesn't have any priorities, but uh, it says give me deflate or give me gzip. Yeah? But all other browsers send it the other way around. So now if you go ahead and naively um, use the headers for caching, you only have half the hit rate. Because uh, basically Internet Explorer has 50% and the other browsers also have 50% altogether. And um, you cache each page twice. Yeah? Because one is cached in deflate and the other is cached in gzip. Yeah? And that's of course bad, yeah? because that effectively um, gives you only half the hit rate which you could achieve. Yeah? And um, using that uh, varnish configuration language, you can be much more clever and say, as soon as I detect deflate, I, only, I set the header to deflate and only handle deflate. Yeah? And everything else is discarded, yeah? which compared to Apache, effectively doubles your hit rate. Yeah? And, and that's really interesting because it, it's, such a, it's such a trivial change, but uh, it gives you such, such a high yield because uh, doubling the hit rate means uh, that you basically only need half the number of application servers. One more thing which you should take into account is uh, the expires header, um, which are sent to your to your client. Yeah? Um, that's a bit tricky because uh, Varnish, on one hand, uh, of course, uh, caches the expires header and sends back the expires header, but uh, you can, of course, change them because the expires header are 
saved by Varnish in the moment when Varnish receives the request, but if uh, you have, say, an expire of 10 minutes and uh, the content is kept for five minutes in the cache, then the, the users will only see at the, end of the at the end of life of the entity in the cache, they will only see expires of five minutes in the future, but that can be adjusted using that uh, VCL receive or VCL deliver function. Uh. Okay, we have some, of course, we have experienced some problems. Um, for example, many websites are not stateless. Our online shop is also, of course, usually not stateless, um, but um, you can take care of that by only creating the cookie, the session cookie, if it's strictly necessary. So most of uh, the application servers like Tomcat and so on are configured in a way that they immediately send J session IDs, even if they don't need it. Yeah? Um, that's something which we eliminated. So what we did is um, that, uh, unfortunately, our website was, was, was ready for that, um, that all, all requests which actually change state on the server were post requests. Yeah? Post requests always have to go to the back-end server because uh, well, Varnish can't handle post. It, it doesn't know what to do with the posted content. It doesn't make too much sense. You could use it as an index, but uh, that's so unlikely that uh, you, have, uh, you have a hit rate that it doesn't make sense. Yeah? So post requests are always going to the application service. They might set a J session ID, which is then returned, and um, then the user goes out of caching. It will, the, the pages which he or she requests will not be cached anymore. But um, you have to make sure that um, your software is ready for that state transition all the time. So most of the software um, takes it for granted that you always get a J session ID. And uh, it might not work, your application, if it doesn't get a J session ID. Yeah? So you have to maybe adjust, do some small adjustments inside your software that it can cope with not getting a J session ID or setting it uh, at maybe not uh, the, usual, the usual place. Yeah? Nevertheless, you should make as many requests stateless as possible um, because that will increase the hit rate. It means if you can stay stateless, then please stay stateless. Yeah? Because only if you're in the stateless mode, then even Varnish can kick in and, uh, and uh, 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 achieve a high hit rate. Ah, okay, and uh, what we also did is that you can maybe keep a simple state on the client side. For example, um, let's say you have a very easily personalized site where it just says, hello, Mr. blah, blah, blah. Then coming from this approach, you'd say, well, you can't cache pages because uh, you have a personalization, so you are in the stateful mode. But you can if you say this, hello, Mr. or Mrs. blah, 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 is uh, generated on the client side. So you read the cookie on the client side in JavaScript code and uh, write it in the client. And then, of course, each page is the same. And these cookies can be removed even because they are only used on the client side. They are not even used on the server side. So you can remove them in Varnish. And uh, even with this uh, easy form of personalization, you can still get the whole hit rate, which is possible via Varnish. You can only cache uh, stateless content pages, which are requested via GET. So uh, caching pages for other HTTP methods, of course, is not possible. Put, post, delete, uh, don't even think about it. And you have to be careful with transactions. Yeah? Um, sometimes you have uh, transactions in the form that something is posted to the website. The website uh, calculates something or changes its internal state, persists something, and sends you redirect uh, to a GET URL because of the back and forward navigation, and uh, you have to be careful that you don't cache these GET requests because you are inside a transaction and the state has already changed on the server. Usually that's taken care of because as soon as a POST request is sent to the application server, you get a session anyway and then you are out of caching, but uh, you have to be careful. How can you handle content changes? Well, the cache can be deleted completely via an atomic operation by just sending the delete to the API. Um, you can selectively delete certain pages like uh, regular expressions and so on, so you have complete freedom. It's really powerful what you can do. And the nice thing is, that it doesn't take ages to expire the cache. Even if you have a one gigabyte cache and you say, now please expire some of these URLs which conform to some regular expression, then it's done immediately. It doesn't take any time. 
and uh, that's that's really fantastic. Yeah? You can also use cache control headers um, to adjust the time which uh, objects can stay in the cache. We can even further optimize the site, and we have exactly done that, because now uh, we have reached this, uh, this gigabit limit, and uh, for further optimization you can use a content distribution network, and which effectively is a distributed uh, cache, but that's only used for static resources. So now we can really deliver 10,000 HTML pages uh, from each Varnish server, and all other objects are then handled quietly by the um, content distribution network, so most of the requests we will never even see. Yeah, it's a lazy content distribution network, so we will see them usually once per per node server. Um, Varnish uh, has some even more sophisticated possibilities for using edge site includes. Edge site include is actually a, a, a W3C um, standard, and if you take a look at uh, such a page template, you see that most even uh, if somebody is personalized or has acquired a session, um, only very few parts of the website actually are changing per user. For example, the shopping cart is changing, or maybe the welcome username to our website changes. The welcome we can use on the client side. The shopping cart might be a bit more difficult. But what you can do is that you say that uh, all except the red parts are saved and varnished, and the red parts are included via a dynamic include, which is only evaluated at runtime when the request is processed by varnish, and then again contacts, for example, the application server or gets the content from some key value store like memcache or whatever. Yeah? Um, that's possible. Um, you can even gain some more performance by performing that whole page assembly, how we call it, putting together the different fragments, not in the application server, because that's uh, a bit too trivial the work to do for the application server, but doing that uh, inside Varnish. You can even go a step further and um, say that we also want uh, to cache these uh, dynamic attributes by really putting the shopping cart, for example, to the key value store. Of course, we have to use the session then as a key, but as this shopping cart is very infrequently changed. It's only changed if somebody changes something in the shopping cart, puts something to the shopping cart, or changes numbers. But it's very often requested. It, of course, makes perfect sense to put it in a distributed or maybe also in a hosted uh, key value store because it's read so many times but written so few times. Uh. So that means um, that the application server can write changing content to this shopping cart key value store and uh, the, even for these personalized users then um, all this stuff is uh, handled by Varnish exclusively. That means that except for really transactional stuff which changes state on the server like changing baskets, uh, logging in or buying stuff, everything else is handled by Varnish exclusively which means that, uh, of course, it's a bit slower then uh, because it has to contact memcache, but uh, we still are well above 5,000 requests per second, and it's really hard to find uh, an online shop which uh, creates such a volume in page requests so that it cannot be saturated by a, uh, by a single Varnish server, server then if we are using all these techniques. Okay, l let me very briefly, that's not directly related to Varnish, but it's directly related to the, to the shop, and we have still maybe five minutes left. I don't need more than five minutes. Let me tell you what happens if we have many transactions. Uh, so everything is fine now, so a lot of visitors are coming to the shop, using the shop, uh, putting something to the basket, to the shopping cart, and so on. And that's really, it's really fast, uh, so we don't have a problem with that now. But now, um, working for Lidl, we, we had a different problem, and that's uh, maybe Maybe you're familiar with that. That's the rail ticket which is sold by, by Lidl just before Christmas, I think. Yeah? And um, the first time they did that, um, we were talking to them, and they said, well, we won't sell um, rail tickets via the online shop. We just have a few, and there will not be many people coming, so there will not be any TV ads and so on, which was not true, unfortunately, because the day before it, uh, this campaign should uh, start, they just uh, sent these TV ads, uh, which in effect uh, 
led to the website uh, being online for a few seconds and then going down. Yeah? And uh, the funny thing is that it didn't went down. Uh, that it didn't go down because of um, well, some not working cache or whatever. But uh, the reason was a completely different one, and I'll show you this uh, in a second. Uh, uh, the reason was that the ERP system became the bottleneck. So why is that? There were many, many transactions, and um, all were for the same product. So people were not just putting that to the basket. That worked fine, but uh, then they were trying to order that. And everything was going to the same product. And all ERP systems we know about are not suited for that kind of transactions, because um, the buying transaction is quite a long transaction for an ERP system, because it has to lock, it has to reserve, and whatever, stuff like that. And if all goes to the same product, uh, it will really be a concurrency problem for the ERP system because every, every, re every request will try to lock the same product. And that's not working. Yeah? So maybe if one of these ordering requests takes five seconds or something like that, yeah, which doesn't keep the, the ERP system busy, but it just takes five seconds because it has to do some calculations and whatever, then it's locked for five seconds. But if you have several thousand uh, users who want to buy the same thing at once, then um, what happens is that uh, the first user goes uh, to the order page that's requested from the ERP, the second one, and so on. Um, and everybody waits. And this finally leads to the effect that if another user wants to request any page, uh, the application server is busy because it doesn't have any threads available. Yeah? So it's just gone. And that means that just due to the fact that the ERP system is so slow in handling these concurrent transactions, the website goes down because all threads are used exclusively in waiting for the ERP system. The really annoying thing was that uh, after two minutes, uh, all of these threads were terminated and all were terminated with error. Yeah, well, that, that was really bad luck. So no pages were shown. The whole site was not working. So that means that the website was down. Unfortunately, that especially happens uh, when these special campaigns are announced and you have to do a lot of advertising for that. And um, this really hurts as uh, the marketing budget is completely wasted. So uh, they had done some marketing, but uh, unfortunately nobody could buy that. Uh, and it really took us a long time to bring the site up again, because as soon as it was brought up again, um, the people said, well, now I can start ordering. And then again, all threads were busy just in communicating with the ERP system. So that's really a uh, very unfortunate situation. Uh, oh, that's partly in German, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, the basic idea now was uh, how to solve that. Um, that we wanted to build uh, an asynchronous interface to the ERP, which is switchable. So usually we work in synchronous mode, but if we really expect very high traffic, then of course the static traffic, the visitor traffic can be handled by Varnish. That's, that's easy, so no, no doubt about it. But uh, now we also want to handle the transactions. Yeah? So we wanted to implement an asynchronous interface to the ERP system. We, choose to uh, we chose to use ActiveMQ, and what now happens is that um, each user tries to order the user doesn't have to wait, so all of these transactions are just given over to ActiveMQ, and they are inside ActiveMQ. I'll tell you what, what happens uh, the, after they have been converted to ActiveMQ. And uh, there are no threads which are kept busy by ActiveMQ because they are just put into ActiveMQ. That's basically just a database operation. There's no locking involved or whatever. So if somebody requests another page, then uh, that's working fine. Yeah? Of course, um, the orders then eventually have to go to the ERP system, but uh, for this uh, we uh, implemented a queue consumer, which is doing that sequentially, and doing this sequentially is not so much of a problem because it, ta it takes long if you have many transactions, but you don't get into that concurrency problem because it doesn't need to be locked. It, well, it is locked, but it's only locked for one um, transaction, and if this is finished, then the next transaction kicks in and so on. Yeah? So that looks fine. Unfortunately, it's not so easy because um, there are some restrictions. We have to know the, the numbers of products in stock in the shop. So that's something new because uh, usually you handle the transactions in the ERP system and if it's uh, running out of stock, then the ERP system says it doesn't work. Yeah? 
there is a slight risk of overorders. Yeah? So, uh, for example, if you have different ordering channels like uh, a call center or whatever, then they might sell out uh, your tickets. But you can take care of that by using a slightly lower number in the shop than what is actually available. Yeah? And of course, the asynchronous error handling is much more difficult and error prone than doing this synchronously. Synchronously, you can tell the user something is wrong with your transaction. Uh, we can't cope with that. Uh, Whatever, yeah, you can take care of that by uh, just offering most of the transactions fail because uh, uh, because of the payment methods. So you say only secure payment methods like uh, payment in advance or payment via credit card is possible in these cases. But if you have uh, strange error conditions like uh, some addresses which are not allowed or some um, some characters which are not allowed in names or whatever, then you have to take care of that by even maybe having to do outbound calls from the call center. But that's something which you can say, well, we take that, uh, but on the other hand, we, we try to sell as much as possible. But that's something which is not uh, for permanent uh, service. Uh, so in effect uh, was that uh, it's it was not going down the site when we did that uh, in the following year, but we were we have been selling almost uh, 100,000 rail tickets within one day. And uh, that's really a lot. Selling 100,000 uh, products per day with two servers, two application servers, uh, it's, it's really much. It, it, it took some time to really deliver that whole stuff, but um, on the other hand, that was not the problem if they had already sold it. Uh, that's the complete architecture of the online shop, which we are using for that, with all the most of the components being open source components, except for for Oracle as a database, which was uh, well company policy from from Lidl. They wanted to use uh, Oracle. We also tested Postgres, which works equally fine, but uh, for political reasons, it's still it's still Postgres. So if this whole shopping crowd is going to come to the shop, we are not afraid, but uh, we can handle that. Yeah. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, I guess the uh, rules you have in your varnish are very, very special to your uh, shop. No. <laughs> um, sounds like, yeah. But um, there's one rule which rules them all, yeah, but uh, which says uh, as soon as this Chase session ID, which is quite uh, global, I think, uh, as soon as this is present, uh, we just short circuit the whole uh, infrastructure and go to Apache or to Tomcat directly. Yeah? And um, there are some specialities, that's true, but um, there's not so many. There's uh, one which um, is. Uh, due to the fact that uh, Lidl is an organization which has uh, 30 sub-organizations in Germany, and each of these sub-organizations has somehow uh, a different selection of products. Uh, so we need to take care of these 30 sub-sites, uh, which uh, basically are the same, but uh, that's something which is really special, but everything else, I'd say, is uh, could be used for another site also, and that's a good question because um, actually what we do, what we did is that we have another customer uh, DHL which is running this mindpaket.de. Maybe you know the site, um, and that's uh, Hybris, which is an e-commerce product which they are using there. And we tried. We said, well, what is working for Lidl must also be working for Mindpaket. Let's try this. Yeah. And it worked, and it worked without even changing a single line in the online shop. So it's just uh, putting this varnish in front of it and, uh, of course, doing some hosts, entries, or whatever, uh, that you can really access it from, from the correct host name. And then it worked out of the box. Uh, and the configuration is maybe slightly different, but it's based on the same, on, on the same ideas. And that worked out of the box. Uh, that's, and that, that's really nice, I think. Uh. If you have an uh, additional um, uh, new release of the shop uh, software, do you test the varnish uh, rules, or uh, is this not necessary? We do, yes. Um, so it's uh, it's in the continuous integration, basically. And uh, we also are very careful if we are deploying a new version of the shop, which really changes some basic functionality, then we very critically observe the hit rate. 
because as I told you, um, this is only relevant in the case where you have one of these spikes and uh, if you don't observe it all the time and it's going down maybe by a factor or something like that, it might already be enough to kill the application servers uh, if you experience one of these high traffic situations. So, so afterwards you maybe uh, tune your rules. After the release of a software, maybe or something like that. Yeah, this. but uh, adjusting the rules has not has not yet been necessary, but it might in the future. Yes. Thank you. Um, with the expiration header, you said um, you can set it on your own. Do you calculate the expiration header? Well, uh, uh, good question. Um, the expires header is usually set by the application server. Yeah, so let's assume it's set to 10 minutes in the future for pages. Huh? Yes, um, most of the time for, for um, a period of time we use cache control, but um, some Yeah, but cache control is a different header, yeah? Yeah. Um, so you I ask because um, cache control you use for a certain period. You can uh, say cache control um, to cache it for 10 minutes, yeah. and with expiration you set an explicit date. And yeah, but uh, usually you just can say, in, for example, in the Apache configuration, you can say expires plus 10 minutes, and then it just adds 10 minutes to the current date. Yeah? So you do this part in Apache? Um, for the static resources, yes. For um, the pages, it's uh, really done in, in the application server, but the expires header is also cached in Varnish. So that means that uh, if the pages stay longer in Varnish, then the time till the really expired date is reached <laughs> changes huh? for the client. Yes. Yeah? And, and that means uh, if you want to keep that constant, then you have to recalculate the expires header in the VCL deliver function when sending the content to the client. Yes, this would be an option. Yeah, yeah. Because we also use Varnish and uh, we see the effect that um, when I start with a fresh cache, mm -hmm. um, everything's empty, um, everything goes through to the web servers. Yeah. Um, at the wrong time of the day, this uh, makes them very slow. And um, when there are many objects with the same expiration date, um, I have some Certain yeah. 30 minute spikes or something like that when everything is spikes in a cache mm -hmm. because uh, most of them was requested in yeah. the first minute. Then you have uh, something like load waves. Yeah. All the resources are requested again. Yeah, uh, that's true, but um, you could also add some noise to the um, distribution in Varnish itself with some random functionality in order to take care of that. So to calculate it in VCL and yeah. add it to yeah. the... And uh, we also have to be careful because usually um, Varnish doesn't take into account the, um, the expires header itself. It's just something which is uh, purely informational, but it's uh, the cache control in this S max H uh, which is really uh, used. Okay, thank you. Uh, what kind of actions do you take in order to get your varnish high available? <laughs> um, well, w uh, fortunately, we don't have to take too many precautions because uh, varnish never went down for us. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> good. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, basically, what 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 is the case here is that um, we have two varnish servers. Yeah, we have a load balancer, and um, the load balancer can ask. Uh, both Varnish servers. Yeah? And the load balancer, of course, has a periodic task where something is requested, but it's not requested from Varnish. Varnish obviously can't deliver any static resources, but there's a special rule that this uh, load balancer file must always come from Apache within Varnish. Yeah? So we always request it from Varnish, and if it's going inside Varnish, then uh, it's requested from Apache, it comes back from Apache and is sent via Varnish to the load balancer, and if everything of this cascade works, it's uh, safe to assume that both Varnish and Apache are working. And But uh, you're losing hit rate, right? <coughs> then, because for the load balancer HTML or? No, for the Varnish caches, because they're separate, both caches? Mm, yes, that's true, but um, 
Yeah, we They're both, both? Active, active, it's yeah, it's active, active. It is, yeah. Um, that's true, we are losing a bit hit rate, but that's not so critical. 50% actually. No. Why? Because they're split. The caches are totally, totally separate. Yeah, yeah, but uh, no, no, we are not losing 50%. Yeah? Okay. Um, let's assume the home page is uh, requested within a five minute interval 20,000 times. Yeah? Um, so uh, we uh, we have uh, and and uh, and uh, <coughs> of these twenty thousand times, uh, each runish gets ten thousand. Yeah? So each runish re creates one Apache request. Yeah? So we have a request rate of ninety nine point nine nine percent on both, or ninety nine point nine ninety nine point nine eight percent compared to ninety nine point nine nine percent. Okay. So that's that's not 50 percent. So that's uh, that's only a very a very small fraction because, um, of course, you you are right that we are actually creating twice as many requests to the application service as would be necessary. But as the factor is so dramatically large, yeah, it's it's not really relevant. Yeah, but uh, I haven't thought about that. It's a good it's a good uh, it's a good point. Yeah, but. Uh, I don't think that we are really losing too much, and I don't have an alternative how we could improve that. But when we are not using an active-active configuration, but an active-passive configuration, of course, it would be better. But then uh, you have to very closely observe whether everything is still working and really, f uh, really fast uh, perform a really fast zero. switch so that you don't uh, produce any outages for the clients. Uh. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I have two questions. Um, the first one, um, you mentioned that you uh, are putting Varnish uh, at the very front, uh, mm -hmm. right behind the load balancers. Um, yes. Why not uh, using Nginx or HA proxy for um, all that stuff that Varnish is not so good in, like logging um, or um, Maybe using uh, mechanisms in HA proxy or, or Nginx or whatever, um, which which can uh, do the uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, like edge side includes and Nginx uh, can do similar things. Um, mm -hmm. Why not using Varnish just for for caching? Um, um, that could be an option, yeah. But um, at the moment, we don't want to get rid of Apache at least not now. Because um, Apache has very sophisticated load balancing possibilities to the Tomcats. We are using more proxy AJP. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I know. You're you saying yeah. another web server. Another in front. But each, uh, uh, each software, in our opinion, which you put still inside the cascade, adds maybe one or two milliseconds in latency. Yeah? Because you have to proxy the request and proxy it again and proxy it again and so on. And this really adds latency. Yeah? We, we've just seen it when we uh, are trying to get this load balancer HTML file. This is always with a latency of uh, one millisecond in Apache, but in Varnish you already have two milliseconds, yeah? which is not a lot. Yeah? Of course, I know. Yeah? So um, we could do that. But um, you also have to make sure that uh, in this scenario, um, none of these three uh, uh, software chains none of the three components fail because otherwise uh, the whole chain is not working yeah? and if uh, at the same time in another chain um, something else might fail then you would be offline at least for, for a small amount of time and that, that's basically because we, we didn't want to sacrifice the still simple uh, uh, architecture f by adding another component but it would be an option of course yes Okay, um, a second question. Uh, you uh, talked about um, uh, fetching contents from a key value store like Memcached or yeah. Redis. Um, are you using um, Varnish 3 with uh, Vmod uh, to do this? or um, how We're do not you doing this now. Okay, uh, okay. We, we could. Uh, um, well, that depends on what you want to achieve. Yeah, of course, you can do it within uh, VCL directly because you can bind to the, to the Memcache library, or you can use um, the edge site include facility and use another server um, which you 
which uh, understands this memcache protocol. So you could, for example, even Apache has, I think, a, a memcache or a Redis module, or Nginx for sure has, and uh, you could just uh, rewrite uh, the rules in the edge side includes to directly include that content um, from, uh, from the web server, which uh, just gets it from memcache. Great. Thank you very much. I'm sorry.